Hi, welcome everyone to the fourth edition of Notes, Tech and Art Encounters. I'm Noemi Jangiro, I'm the director of the Goethe Institute San Francisco and member of the UNIC cluster Silicon Valley. I'm very excited about our artists and experts today as we focus on Nokia's Bell Labs experiments in arts and technology. The Idea Factory, as some call the Bell Labs, might be the leading research organization in information technology and communication. But what is even more impressive to me is the marks that its EAT program has left in art and art history through projects like Nine Evenings and continues to do so today. Nine Evenings was conjured up by Robert Rauschenberg and Billy Klüver. It was the first large scale collaboration between artists, engineers and scientists developing new ideas on the use of new technology in theater. So how did Nine Evenings influence further exchange between art and technology? What characterizes art and tech collaborations within the EAT program today? And can collaborations like these contribute to dealing creatively with some of the ethical challenges we are facing through high tech and AI today in our future as well? These are some of the questions we want to explore today. Notes, Art and Tech Encounters is a series of talks that supports the exchange of artists, technologists and research, researchers between the US and Europe. The series was established within the UNIC cluster Silicon Valley, which is a network of European diplomatic and cultural institutions working with local partners in the Bay Area and beyond. Through projects like Nodes, but also the Grid Exposure, Art, Tech and Policy Days, um, a project that took place this September, um, we interrogate these kind of intersections in art and tech and we try to find new ways of collaboration between art and tech with our partners. If you would like to find out more about the grid, nodes, or the UNIC cluster, please visit us on getonthegrid.org. Now, let me finally introduce a fantastic woman that will lead us through the discussions today, Marnie Benny. She is an independent curator working at the intersection of contemporary art and technology. Over the last decade, she has produced 27 exhibitions over the whole world. Uh, including in city centers, public spaces, galleries, and festivals, including spaces like the New York Hall of Science and the Nook Gallery in Los Angeles. Benny's work investigates the societal, cultural, and future implications of technology through the lens of contemporary art. In 2019, Benny launched AIArtists.org. It's the world's largest community of artists using AI and she, there she serves as a curator and provides a platform for the artists to explore the future implications of AI on our societies. Hi, Marnie. Hello, thank you so much, Noemi, for inviting us here today. And a huge thank you to the Goethe Institute for providing a platform on which to talk about the future of innovation and how art and artists play a huge part in its shaping. We have a fabulous group on the panel today who have been in the trenches, so to speak, about creating space for art and technological collaborations in organizations and in academia. Not only have these collaborations happened, but they've flourished, resulting in impactful, innovative, and often fun projects. First, I will briefly introduce each panelist, and then I will give them a brief opportunity to introduce themselves and the projects that they're working on. After that, we'll have our panel discussion, and then we'll have our questions at the end. But feel free to put it in your questions in the Q&A section. First, I'll start with Dunal. Dunal Hernan has a PhD in aerodynamics and an MBA. He previously led research and development organizations and developed and executed strategies to overcome the innovation valley of death. He is head of the Experiments in Art and Technology, EAT, at Nokia Bell Labs, home to nine Nobel Prizes, and among other numerous awards that they have received. EAT is a new innovative innovation that he found to fuse art and engineering and science to develop solutions that humanize technology. 
Seth Kluett is a New York-based composer and a visual artist who creates work that explores everyday actions at extreme magnification, examines minutiae by ampli amplifying impossible tasks, and tries to understand the working of memory in forms that rethink the role of the senses in an increasing technological society. Ashley Fellow Murray is curator of the theater and dance at the Curtis R. Prime uh, Inter Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Her curatorial practice focuses on expanding historical frames for performance and technology artworks by supporting artist-centered approaches to media. So first, we'll start with Dunal, if you want to talk a little bit about yourself and your work. Hey everyone, thank you Marnie. Hey Seth, and uh, nice to meet you Ashley. We haven't had a chance to chat yet, so this is uh, great. I'm looking forward to this. Let me um, share my slides here if I can, because I'm going to use visuals as a crutch. Uh, so let's see. Um, who can share? All panelists, thank you. That's okay for me. I can't seem to get my slides up. I keep on working on it, but I'll talk and I'll use the gift of the gab that Irish culture gave me in the meantime. So I'm a trained engineer. You mentioned that I, you know, I did aeronautical engineering, and I came from that deep engineering, science-y, scientific method approach in my training. And I joined Bell Labs. I was, I was expected to use that very much so on how I delivered value to both the research organization and to our parent companies. So that was all fine. Did lots of work on tech. You know, very happy with myself and my achievements and whatever. Um, and eventually. Uh, roll forward a number of years is 2016. It's the 50th anniversary of the nine evenings. Uh, we were invited to a number of events in New York City, uh, those of us in Bell Labs, to celebrate some of these, this history of Bell Labs that honestly we had forgot about. And we could talk about that a little bit later. Um, and about 10 of us or so were at these events, and Seth was one of the first artists we spoke to. And every single conversation blew my mind. And I realized that. With all of the letters behind my name and all of my education and all of my uh, experience in the company and all of the things that I thought I could have been proud of achieving, that they actually meant nothing in comparison to the way that these conversations moved me, made me think about the world in a totally different way, and really provoked thinking in me and opened up new lenses to the world that I was completely blind to and that I know for a fact not just then, but now today, that most of my colleagues generally in engineering science, whether they're in industry or in academia, are very much the same way. And that's an artifact of the way we're trained and the way we're expected to deliver value into these companies um, with market pressures and near-term horizons and all of that. So we had these conversations a few years ago, blew my mind, uh, a number of others in Bell Labs were impressed, and we said we dip our toes back in the art and tech waters because we hadn't been in it since about 1980 by my estimates. Um, and we started working with Seth and others, and we just found so much value with their ways of thinking and doing and thinking about the world and the intersection of humanity and technology. And this more human-centric approach to everything they do, we just found immense value in trying to bring that deep into our research. And we started the programs in a low-key way, um, beg borrowing and stealing resources from different parts of the labs, no one officially working on it. To today, we have three full-time staff. We are supporting this year more than 20 artists. And as I said, Seth has been a long-term collaborator of ours and a big friend to the program, uh, advising us on how to make sure we can always drive this in the right direction. So that's at a super high level for me personally, coming from the background I came from in industry, in tech, and where I personally have seen value in this intersection, but also I see immense value for tech, for industry, broadly for society. I think this intersection has not been leveraged enough. And I truly believe the future of innovation lies at the intersection of art and technology. So I leave it there as a quick intro. Perfect, thank you so much. Seth, do you wanna go next? Sure, uh, thanks so much for uh, having me, allowing me to, to join in this conversation. Um, you know, I come from a very strange background. Uh, I'm a, 
I was, uh, I grew up rurally, actually not far from Troy, New York, where MPAC uh, is. I was born in Troy, uh, um, but uh, I grew up in a rural uh, uh, blue collar machining family, uh, people making things with their hands, but uh, I turned into a composer somehow out of that. I uh, went to Boston and did uh, an undergraduate in, in, in composition and then later uh, joined the Harvard Institute for Music and Brain Science as the, as the musician on the team working on sense issues in uh, sensory issues in in uh, neuroscience and music perception. Took some time off after school. Uh, ended up going to RPI actually for an MFA in electronic art, uh, where uh, where I was very active in the sort of pre-MPAC universe of Rensselaer's electronic art practice. Um, I then ended up being the artist at the Human Environment and Interaction Lab at uh, at the Architecture School at at RPI, which was sort of formative to my. Uh, to my uh, art and tech engagement. We were working on synthetic senses. Uh, uh, the theme of the lab was if you understand the world with senses you have, how much more world is there to understand with senses you don't. And um, I sort of, I ended up at Princeton for a PhD in music composition, but I was making installations and writing, um, uh, approaching art and technology uh, through the lens of sound, uh, not necessarily music so much, uh, even though it was a music degree. Um, I'm now the assistant director of the Computer Music Center and Sound Art Program at Columbia University. Um, I'm a member of Composers Inside Electronics. Uh, I've been the artist in residence steady state at, at Bell Labs since 2017 in May. Uh, and I still hold a studio there when I'm allowed access, given the COVID situation, which we're, you know, all struggling with at the moment. Um, but I also run a lab at uh, at Columbia that's working on data access, uh, embedded systems, and spatial audio uh, as ways of displaying data to everyday people in local communities. So ways of thinking about art as a as a cipher for how you can uh, share information with uh, with and gather information from constituencies that normally don't have access to that data or uh, an interpretive uh, schema that allows that data to be legible. So, so that's sort of uh, where I'm at at the moment. Great. I was listening so intently, I forgot to almost turn on my microphone there. Um, really interesting stuff, guys. Okay. And so, Ashley, last but not least, in a bit, um, would you would you uh, explain a little bit about yourself and your work? Sure, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and Steph, I knew about your alumnus status at RPI, but I didn't realize that you were a Troy native. So um, that's awesome. I, I love that tidbit. Um, and fellow, fellow upstate girl here, too, uh, from west of Troy. But um, yeah, so nice to be in conversation with you all. So, so I think I kind of was introduced to this panel because of... Um, some dissertation that research that I did several years ago on um, experiments in art and technology nine evenings. Um, one of the sort of original projects out of the initiative um, in which I was focusing on the choreographic threads in the project within a performance studies PhD program at UC Berkeley. Um, so, so spending some time also in the Bay Area at the time. And I was really interested in the ways in which a kind of feminist female perspective was coming in quite strongly through those evenings and also how a kind of glitch and failure aesthetic was being um, embodied and played out. And um, that research and a kind of deep dive into those archives um, at the Getty um, and also in New York really led me to a larger contemporary interest in exploring what the future of this field might look like. Um, and so when I finished my PhD research, I um, came over here to MPAC, which stands for the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center, and is housed at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, um, which is this incredible um, you know, institute where, as Seth mentioned, there is this electronic media arts program and an architecture program, folks who are really centering from an academic perspective these conversations about um, the intersection between art and technology. And in 2008, um, our, our university president, Dr. Jackson, along with Johannes Goebel, um, who is our founding director and current director of MPAC, um, started this great program that fuses three different artistic strands. I run the theater and dance program um, at MPAC. I'm the curator of that. We also have a music and sound program and a time-based visual arts program. 
And so like those early experiments um, that really inspired my work in this field, we work on a daily basis um, to really kind of fuse not only an art technology perspective, but also from inside of an artistic conversation, think about what cross-disciplinary conversation looks like and how, in fact, the crossing of artistic disciplines itself can also bring about some of this um, focus on the future of media in our fields. So I work with an array of artists. We're a residency and development center. So I work very closely with folks from the inception to um, the execution of projects and then beyond. And when artists come to work with us, they're working with a team of engineers um, who focus on artistic production. So video and audio engineers. Um, we have someone who's uh, specializes in robotics and rigging on our staff and um, really kind of centering technology, but within an artistic frame. That's great. So both of you have, or Ashley and Duno, um, maybe this is for you guys. Could you explain just a little bit so we have a little bit more of the historic context of EAT and sort of how it started? Ashley, you mentioned, you know, that you did some um, work on that or research on on, on that. And, um, and not to get too, too in the weeds of it, but um, sort of what were the main things um, or the ideas or the philosophies of the program in the past and how are they, um, how how have they informed the current program uh, now? Do you want to start, Dunal, or? I'm happy to learn sure. from you, actually. Sure. And I can, sure. <laughs> I, I can add some uh, kind yeah. of color and flavor in between, yeah. maybe from a more from the inside perspective that I've learned in recent times as well. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, what was so interesting to me about um, spending time in this world was to really look at some of the old uh, personal correspondence between the collaborators and some of the like earliest statements made by Billy Kluver and Rob Rauschenberg about the intention of the events. And, and what I found was that it really was this focus on you know, what is happening to our world? Can the arts save us? <laughs> and, and can an artistic perspective come in and lend a sort of humanist um, lens through which we consider how um, developments in technology will impact social and cultural structures moving forward? Um, and, and that really felt like a pretty strong bedrock. Um, and and it, was, it was amazing really to see, you know, I think that a lot of the... Um, choreographers involved. They had been working in the Judson Church community with others. You know, of course, John Cage was a, a central participant at that time. And, and those folks had already been working with, with media and technology in their work. Trisha Bound has, a, has an incredible piece where she kind of moves around with a um, old movie projector on her back. And, and there are some really early examples of um, you know, sort of slices that you see enter in if you look at photographic documentation of Nine Evenings and the earliest EAT experimentations, um, and then where they went beyond Nine Evenings, of course. Um, but I think that these were kind of like strands that had started to percolate within the community. And then this, this collaboration between Billy Kluver and Robert Rauschenberg kind of formalized the conversation and said, okay, if artists can have a perspective here, let's all also find them actual engineering support to bring these two disciplinary perspectives together. And one of the things that I really appreciate about the approach is an acknowledgement that both ends of the conversation bring a disciplinary specificity and um, knowledge and, you know, like archival perspective and all of these things. And then once you peel back into the real nitty gritty of the, um, of the personal correspondence that were happening at the time, of course, you do see some of the power structures to, to sort of reveal themselves, right? And that the artists are feeling like the technology might be taking the foreground and vice versa um, and, mm -hmm. and where that sort of balance or imbalance starts to shape, take shape as the date of the evenings, um, you know, comes up. Uh, so, so it is like in those earliest forms. And I think that I will say in doing this work today, I think not much of that kind of back and forth and conversation has changed. It feels like those questions and concerns are very much still at the fore of, of this kind of work. Yeah, I can just add a little bit. I, you know, I think they were so far ahead of their time. It mm. was, it's just shocking, really. 
uh, very inspirational. You know, there's there's an inside Bell Lab story, which is very interesting, which is that, uh, and by the way, there's a lot of history in art and tech in Bell Labs that has nothing to do with EAT, totally separate internal art and tech collaborations that we really haven't told those stories at all. And we're working on a project to take those stories out to the public. But EAT is best known. But funny enough, EAT was not sanctioned by the parent company at and wasn't officially sanctioned and it was because of Billy Cleaver and Fred Wall and their personal connections with the artist and his personal interest that he made this happen. Now, management and Bell Labs supported this by giving 30 engineers or so access to technology, but they couldn't put the official AT&T Bell Labs brand on it because there was issues with the monopoly and uh, the company being seen to spend money on these kind of social slash civic activities and there was all these things of optic, optics and politics that got in the way of them being officially connected to but honestly it probably was better off being decoupled from the big corporate entity and i think that gave them a lot more freedom which is also something to consider in any of these art and tech collaborations because corporate structures absolutely almost always through process will hinder creativity and that's exactly the opposite of what these programs have to do. And, and that's one of the biggest barriers when you're in the tech world and trying to embrace these types of fusions or collaborations or interactions is it goes against everything that's at the core of the corporate parent. And we could talk about that at length um, at some stage as well, which is kind of a fun conversation. Would it be okay to add a quick thing? Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think it's also crucial uh, to maybe lift up Julie Martin as an incredibly important uh, voice in this dialogue. Uh, uh, Julie was the um, was the production manager for EAT throughout the duration of the life of the program. Uh, she happened to be married to Billy Kluver uh, and so gets shadowed uh, by the spousal relationship. But if EAT is something that people are aware of and know about today, they uh, know about it through the current program and Julie Martin's incredible efforts to archive, document, and distribute the history of EAT. And so uh, she tends to get uh, left out of the discussion, not by uh, Nokia Bell Labs, but, but in, in large part in, the art, in art history through sheer force of uh, masculine forgetfulness. So I think- Yeah, and I have to say she, she is like, tirelessly, you know, has been still at it. I mean, she was so supportive of my research and kind of like when I was a very young student, right, but like taking it so seriously and really investing and sharing those materials super generously. And yeah, thanks, Seth, for bringing that up. I agree. It's so important. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, Seth, um, Seth and Ashley, I, I would love to ask you how does, and this is kind of a big question, but um, you know, you can take it bit by bit, but um, how does technology influence, inform, or help inspire your creative process? And Dunal, kind of the converse question for you is how does working with artists help inspire um, your process and the projects that you that you work on? Um, and feel free to, you know, you can you don't have to give all the examples because I know you guys have a lot of really great projects to share. But um, whoever wants to go first. Seth, do you want to go ahead first? Sure, I can say a couple things. Um, you know, I, I was about to say that I'm a symbiote uh, that lives on technology, uh, but that's a little bit too much of a simplification. I have these dueling problems where uh, I am technology obsessed and try to keep as little of it as I can in my work. And so the stuff that makes it into my work is there at the service of the ideas of the practice. Um, the I think it's one of the one of the real struggles of art and technology is the shiny, everyone runs towards the shiny thing and tries to make a new piece with the newest tech. And I think uh, uh, in making work, it has to be a dialogue with how, how, how the newness plays a role in the practice. And I think for people, especially audiences, to have a real uh, uh, deep, profound engagement with the work, the work has to speak to the people and the technology, if it's not participating in that dialogue is uh, doing a disservice to the work. And so uh, for me, I always hold technology at arm's length and in most of my work, and I think maybe the reason that I've been at Bell so long is that I'm a techno skeptic. My job in most of the meetings I'm in is to highlight how people are forgetting human beings have 
sensory systems that technology acts as a prosthesis for or extension of, uh, but that I spend a lot of time uh, thinking about what technology has done to erode our senses and what, uh, and what when we use it, it might do to bring back, not in a prelapsarian sense of return to some old thing, but what do our new senses look like when we, when we uh, construct with technology as a sort of interstitial part. So, so for me, I, I'm, I'm skeptical, but also dedicated. And so, <laughs> so the balance between those two things in practice, uh, you know, it's, it's been, um, it's been nice to be at Bell because that dialogue, uh, that dialogue is constant where people are, they're art skeptics, most of them, not all of them, but many of them. And so the, and so like where that, you know, hovers in the middle of this kind of gravity well is a really fascinating uh, place to be. Great. Yeah, I think, um, yes, <laughs> reach. Um, I totally agree with you. I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, taking a kind of like technophobic approach as a technophilic, as opposed to a technophilic one from the get go feels like so central to this kind of work um, for so many reasons. And yeah, I mean, I was a, I was a practitioner myself before I, I took on this curatorial role, but in the last five years have really transitioned. And so now my more recent work really is as more like a facilitator between an artistic perspective and a technical one, really kind of working to help translate across between our artists um, who are working with us and our technical teams. And um, I think, I guess, just two things that I'll say. One is I totally agree, Seth, and for me, part of that sort of like um, really kind of remaining critical, positively critical of the presence of media in a work is also leaving space for, to take it out. Um, and so, especially because artists don't often get to have technology unless they have an institutional affiliation, um, a standing one, that, that in their daily practice, they may not have access to the kinds of resources that a place like MPAC can afford them. And so trying to really carve space for um, pointed research using uh, materials and media and engineering perspective that one might not have access to. But part of that, exposure is also leaving room for artists to really see, okay, what does this do for my practice? And then to realize like, maybe it doesn't do anything for it. Maybe actually my practice doesn't need this in it, or maybe it's pulling me away from the core questions that I'm trying to get toward. Um, and I think, especially within an artistic context that is run historically and contemporaneously upon a scarcity model, um, it's really hard for artists to kind of come to terms with having resources at hand and then feeling like it's okay to waste that time and space and energy and and um, material good right and so to really reframe that and i think this is something that has really been at the core of of eats kind of like rhetorical grounding is is that um in fact it's not a waste and that failure is really worth something here and of course that's a central tenet of artistic practice but for some reason when it comes into these sorts of um technical conversations sometimes artists can lose that and so i think holding that um close is important and then i will say too that getting outside of this corporate context I think in part really um, begs an acknowledgement that more perspectives have to be brought to the table. And I know Seth mentioned a disability perspective, which I think is, is key here, um, but really like centering a black indigenous art of, artists of color voices, queer perspectives in the conversations. Um, and then, you know, acknowledging also that, that, different approaches to technology may define technology differently, in fact. Um, and so being really open and fluid with definitions and boundaries as well for the field and for um, specific concepts within it. Um, and then again, translating across the disciplines to, to make, sh make clear why that's such a valuable practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you asked me to comment on the flip, right? How I, now, before I do, I just, maybe react a little bit to something Seth said, because I think this is really important for any artist on the call, but any 
people in tech that are thinking about how they would embrace this type of fusion of these worlds. He, Seth does not sit in a room with our engineers and scientists and lambast them and act cynically and tell them that they're idiots and that they forgot about humanity. What he, because by the way, we have worked with artists for a very brief period of time that do that. And that doesn't go very well when they're in this attack mode, speaking in abstract language in a very esoteric way, right? So if you want to collaborate, that's not the way to do it. But what Seth does do, and this is very important, for both sides of the equation, he sits there and he will point out a possible different way of thinking, but he will also position it in a way that is challenging to them from their perspective. In other words, technically, technologically, and he even then will uh, bring in the snippets of philosophical and the aesthetic, but he, he knows how to speak to them in a way that's going to resonate with them and challenge them. And that is critically important. And that's what good collaboration is. And then our engineers and scientists, after a period of time, they get to know Seth and the other artists, they get to start embracing these different ways of communicating and uh, challenging Seth and understanding Seth and them understanding each other. And that's what collaboration is about. And if these things aren't collaborative, then they're nothing at all. They're either transactional based on a marketing need or there's something else, maybe just ad hoc uh, practices going nowhere. But if you want true collaboration, true fusion of this way of thinking, it's that kind of collaborative, open mindset, adaptiveness that's critically important. And, and I could talk endlessly about that as well, because it's that's what's been, in my view, the success of our program is selecting the right artists that are open-minded enough and selecting the right engineers that are open-minded enough and then trying to help them bridge and overcome their inherent tendencies to not be able to work together. So anyway. There's, I, yeah. there's one little thing that I can add on to that that I think might uh, be the flip of the flip, which is that over the course of the uh, three or so years that I've been there, been here, uh, there, where there is now. Um, uh, the I've been the mentor for the New Inc. artist program through New Inc., not through Bell Labs separately, but um, but I've also been in this role of like when new artists come, I end up having coffee with them and I do a spiel about exactly what Dunal's saying, which is, you know, what are you interested in? What are you trying to get at? And then like the worst situations are one where an artist comes in and says, well, they have this specific technology and I'm, de I'm determined to include it in my work. And that transaction is, is, a, is a form of um, non-dialogical inhumanism that uh, collapses the, the uh, conversation between artists and technologists. The idea that technology is a commodity is a real problem already in society. And when artists start to see tech orgs that they intersect with as being commodity providers, then it becomes no different than going to Home Depot and buying a, a bunch of PVC pipe. Like you need that material in your work. And so it has to be something different. And I think my longitudinal role there has allowed me to see that change over the years where the discourse from inside the organization to how they onboard artists who are engaging uh, uh, sets the expectations of dialogue uh, out front, where at the very beginning, you know, it was hit or miss whether that was successful. And as it's it's grown now with 20 artists, I'd say there's probably, you know, 18 who are real, who are real collaborators who want to engage uh, in a dialogic way with the organization. So. Yeah, exactly. But, it, you know, we had our growing pains and we had to learn tough lessons early, but, um, you know, that's life. So to answer your question, to come back to it, so I could give you lots and lots of examples, including projects with Seth that have played a significant role in informing the way we do research, develop technology, and the intersection of humanity and technology. But instead of doing that, I can talk about that later if someone's interested. I'll give you an example just very personally. So for example, and this could only have happened because of my conversations and collaborations with artists. I've been thinking a lot very recently about, you know, the role of emerging technology, right? And of course, all buzzy emerging technology, blockchain, quantum, 5G, MLAI, VRA, or whatever, right? And there's loads more. Now, think about emerging technology in the very recent past. In 2010, two emerging technologies collided, 4G mobile connectivity and social media, online social media platforms, right? Now, think about the damage that that has done to humanity and to our humanity. And I'll just take two damaging uh, concerns, which are a global pandemic of uh, digital loneliness and a global pandemic of fake news. 
And that arose from just the collision of two emerging technologies ju just 10 years ago. Now, granted, 2010 seems like an eternity ago in uh, COVID years, but it's a very short period of time uh, in human evolution. And it's completely disrupted the way we uh, live and work and the way we interact with the world and other people around us. Now, okay, fine. Now, how many do you think in the Valley or anywhere else in tech have really contemplated that? And then I'll go a step further. I'm thinking a lot now in 2030, I can name 10 emerging technologies that are going to collide, that are going to be completely pervasive in the world in 10 years from now. And what the hell bad outcomes are going to come of that because of the pervasion of that technology and how the people that are developing that can't even contemplate asking those types of questions. Now, that's a very personal, that's something I'm thinking about a lot, but this is very interesting to me. There's, don't get me wrong, there's extremely interesting business opportunities and revenue generation opportunities at that collision, but there's also extremely interesting challenges to our humanity and how do we think about them up front and hopefully design around them or design them out as best we can, which might be very difficult, by the way, and it's hard to predict these things. I'm not saying that. But at the very least, people developing this tech should be asking that question. And I could never have even contemplated that question. And I can guarantee you that there's very few of my colleagues, and I'm not talking about in our company, I mean globally in the tech world, engineering, science, and technologists, that even contemplate asking that question. And I can tell you, I've only asked the question because of conversations with our artistic collaborators and how they've completely changed how I think about the world and the connection to our humanity. I wonder if That's I could great. respond really Yeah, go quick. ahead, go ahead, yes, think? yes, please. Because I think it's, it's a conversation that's come up a lot working with artists in the midst of the COVID pandemic, especially because I work in live performance. And so folks are really asking a lot of questions about what it means for work to go online. And, and one thing that I found actually is that I think oftentimes, even I'll include myself, I have the assumption about, for example, the dance world that going online might get us away from physical presence and lead, right, like you're saying, to this kind of digital loneliness and that these sorts of critical perspectives may come out of an artistic perspective. And at the same time, what I'm seeing happen is that certain artists, like I've just been collaborating with Jamel Alawale um, Kosako, and who has really kind of taken this to say, well, actually my practice has really needed this because it is um, a kind of reenacted trauma for me to continue to perform black queer life on stage over and over again in person and to have to tour my body internationally at such a rigorous pace. And so now that arts institutions are taking online forms seriously and prioritizing them and validating them with funds attached to them, um, I am able to kind of have a more um, sustainable and humanist practice, right, through a kind of humanity online. Um, and so at the same time, I think you're totally right that we get from this artistic and humanist perspective the, the kind of critical lens through which one can consider the future of specific technological developments and how they'll impact our society. And I think that we can learn how they might also be used toward a more kind of positivist approach. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. And I'm so glad that you brought up your work with, um, with um, Jamila, so uh, because that was one of my questions for you, specifically the Chameleon Project and the in living the living installments. Um, and could you speak a little bit more about the transition um, that this artist had to make, and and how they came up with this sort of like new idea? And I know that you guys kind of helped them realize the new technology through Discord. Um, and then how, speak a little bit more about how you see that impacting the future of technology um, and performance art in, in general. Yeah, sure. I mean, if there's one thing that I have, I have learned even in the last six months, it's that I think that not one kind of technical approach or, um, 
purported solution is going to work for any two folks <laughs> through this. Um, and so where, where one artist may find a home on Zoom, another one needs Discord, and another one needs to be offline entirely. And I think what's key in this moment is that we're not making assumptions for folks about what is going to serve their practice most, but that we're really acknowledging a kind of media specificity and how each individual platform has particular modes of communicating and sending information, and they're going to impact the work differently. And so depending who's making a project, something else might um, be appropriate. Um, and so, and with Jamil, we were in the middle of, of putting up um, a, a three-year-long commission, a premiere of the work. It was a collaboration also with New York Live Arts in New York City um, and several national and international partners. And um, the, the kind of COVID like true shutdown mid-March happened just a week before uh, Jamil and, and his collaborators were to arrive in person at MPAC. And so they were kind of like in the middle of the shutdown um, and we ended up pivoting quite swiftly with their team um, to move toward a, a space on Discord, which is predominantly used as a, as a kind of gaming, um, you know, social gaming platform, um, but we used it to build a kind of space for Jamil to share um, archival materials, um, audio and pre-recorded audio and video materials, and also to host um, audio conversations with other collaborators and to have a large group of folks gather. And it was never meant to be a kind of replacement of the live work that had been planned, which um, would have been called chameleon of biomythography. And, and it wasn't planned to have a life beyond itself either. It was really born of necessity. We were really struggling to work on video conference. It was holding collaboration back between the artists and our engineers. Um, and we found a more fluid flow in a place where we could really quickly share kind of multimedia content and where where a video conference element was not there. It felt physically freeing to the group. Um, and so if I may speak for them. Um, and uh, what ended up happening is this production environment felt so generative. And I might even use the word therapeutic in this moment of crisis that Jamil kind of decided, okay, like, let's just live here and invite folks in with us. And what ended up happening was a really beautiful congregation of, of probably around a thousand people um, coming together for a three hour period to just be with one another in a moment where folks were feeling the, the kind of weight of isolation. Uh, it happened on April 22nd. Birthday, um, and and since then the, the project has actually go, gone on to tour. And some of our engineers were very skeptical. They said, you know, how does a project that's online tour? Like, where does it tour to? It's an online work. Um, but different institutions have kind of picked it up in different iterations and hosted different, um, you know, like time windows into it. Um, and it has kind of become a project in and of itself that that may not have happened otherwise. And a space I think for Jamil to find care and sustainability in his practice, which far predated a COVID crisis. Um, this is an artist who's been working with uh, visual materials, moving image documents for quite some time. And I think that's also important to mention because um, as everyone on this panel knows, to, to ask someone who doesn't have any experience working in these media um, and forms to just dive into it is extraordinarily difficult. So this is someone who had kind of come with an interest um, and a pre-articulated focus in this area and a desire to go there um, rather than kind of force it upon his, his work. It was sort of an opportunity that felt um, you know, nascent to the project already. You know, something that I'm, I'm hearing from everyone here is this idea of relationships and long-term relationships and, and real support and sort of not an idea of this transactional, okay, you know, I want this from you and you want this from me. It's more of like a, uh, a living together. And especially when you have something like a pandemic happen, it's a new living and experiencing together where a lot of things change. Um, and you sort of have to rethink about your relationship and how to support each other kind of together cohesively in these, in these, um, in these, 
in these collaborations. And so I'm wondering if um, if kind of everyone maybe what just wants to give like a quick couple thoughts about that, because I think this is a very, very important um, part uh, and very important um, aspect. If, if, if people as artists are thinking about working with larger organizations or, you know, in academia, and I think it's also really important um, for, for companies to really realize and, and you know, um, institutions to realize what what is successful if you want to have a successful relationship um you know it might look a little bit different than like that initial need or kind of more of a a transactional thing uh, i comment just a little bit um so in my experience being a trained engineer around people that think very much like me traditionally I couldn't imagine, or nor have I found a world more different to that way of thinking and training than the artistic, creative world. In, in every dimension you can imagine, I think both those worlds are as opposite as you can get. And that's why they don't work typically well together today, not naturally. There's these inherent barriers around communication, understanding how we think about the world, solve problems, all that kind of stuff. So th this is like oil and water. They don't mix well organically. So you have to force that somehow. And one of the ways is certainly upfront through curation, picking the right collaborators on both sides, the engineer, the scientist, the artist, all of that, right? I think I talked about that a little bit earlier, but I could talk at length about that. But the other side then is you have to acknowledge that nothing good in the world in modern times happens unless it's through deep collaboration. And you can only overcome these barriers through deep collaboration. And deep collaboration means you understand the other person's communication style, their preferences, their tensions, how they think about the world, how they communicate about the world. Each party has to be um, adaptable, needs to compromise, there has to be give and take, and you need to not lose your head if someone says something that you interpret a certain way and that's not how they meant it. You need to ask the question and say, hey, I don't quite get what you meant by that. Could you explain? And then you do this translation mechanism and people just learn to communicate. And this is a big problem with life in general is there's a lot of people that actually don't know how to communicate but it's a particular barrier when you bring artists and engineers scientists together just naturally because of the different ways they're trained or the way they think about the world so collaboration is beyond important and good collaboration does not occur very quickly and good collaboration takes a lot of time and energy and that's why our residency program we choose to work with artists for a minimum of a year at a time and then there's you know, some folks like Seth and others that we've worked with for many years, and those relationships have been extremely fruitful, at least to us. Um, and there's others that last for a year, but we find that we need that year. We, we even give our artists four or five months just exploring our culture and our people and our technology in complete exploration mode before they, we even ask them to contemplate what's the actual project they might do with us. Um, and you just need that time. And nothing good happens in life without giving it that time. And that's, for me, what collaboration is all about. And without collaboration, there's nothing. It's just transactional. It's just some kind of a marketing ploy for a brand. And there's really, really not longevity to it or um, substance to it or substance to it, I should say. I could say something about this, too. I think, you know, um, the sort of the American university system and uh, and the tech universe have suggested uh, sort of in offhand comments that an undergraduate liberal art degree is kind of useless. And uh, except for like 70% of CEOs have undergraduate liberal arts degrees. They've got an MBA afterwards, but they started with this other thing. And what I think people people are very bad at secondary causation. Like they don't understand, like if it doesn't have a primary effect, they think it's useless because that's the kind of goal driven, you know, um, I hate to say masculine approach to technology and society, but the, the, the reality is there's a secondary causal relationship between people who study the humanities and then the, the things that teaches them about the way that their, uh, the, the world's knowledge can be synthesized, uh, 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 criticized, pushed forward, and then communicated effectively. And I think one of the things that's been um, that's been so crucial to the, I think, success of the program at Bell Labs has been that there are a handful of people who are able to do that humanities-level synthesis job 
to translate between constituents. And so like my role most of the time is I speak enough tech to, to translate engineer to artist and I speak enough artist to translate artist to engineer. And then I speak enough administration to figure out how to do all of those things without losing money. And so the, so the, so the, I've been called into meetings as a fly in the wall and then debrief it afterwards to try to understand what it is that an artist is trying to get at. Right. But I think it's crucial that core, that, that people who want to work with artists also bring in the people who they don't immediately understand like for whom it's not absolutely clear how they'll engage with the org. I think some very successful projects have come through Bell Labs where the initial intent of the artist was absolutely unclear because that's how art happens sometimes. It's this big messy thing that then uh, congeals into something that's coherent. And I think uh, people realizing that there needs to be someone in a translation position who's there long-term to do the the back and forth between uh, the types of minds, but but um, but also taking risks on different kinds of artists because each one is going to have a different kind of effect depending on the kind of person that they're working with. And so, so it's been interesting to watch those different kinds of minds poke into research projects at Bell Labs. And and I don't want to say destabilize; that would suggest that this causes chaos. But um, but cause uh, you know inserting divergent thinking into linear thinkers <laughs> creates uh no 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 what i really believe is and then something new comes out of this sort of uh um dialectic of uh one kind of thought another kind of thought and then this thing that nobody individually could have gotten to on their own which i think or would have but at a time scale totally unreasonable for uh, for normal practice mm -hmm. yeah i guess this is super and said it better <laughs> Sorry, Ash. One, one quick thing before you go, Ashley. Um, the audience, if you, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the question and answer box because um, we're gonna get to questions pretty pretty soon here. But Ashley, I'd love, uh, I'd love for you to finish what you're. Yeah. No, I was just gonna say that that I couldn't have said it better. That that feels like a really um, true. I just it both of those perspectives resonate so much and I think that um you know they also really complement one another in that I think that in order to create space for artists who don't already have we'll call it like the lingo or the exposure or the um the pre-existing knowledge base to do that kind of like engineering speak um that that kind of long term support and exposure allows for these other types of conversations to emer emerge. Um, and I absolutely agree that that longer term investment in that sense will kind of diversify the perspectives that we're able to include in these conversations because they're not already necessarily built into an arts perspective or degree. Um, and that's one of the cool things that I actually do get to experience here at Rensselaer and that Seth, um, you know, experienced as a student is that I do think there are some institutions like ours where it's there, there is an effort to bring these things together from the get go with students. Um, and I also think that doing that kind of from the ground up can really lead toward fruitful collaborations like the ones that, that you're both talking about. Great. Well, thank you guys. Um, I'm just gonna, we're running a little bit over time and this is such an interesting conversation. I feel like we could talk for hours, um, but just uh, before we switch to questions, I would love just kind of some final thoughts and words. I mean, I, we had, so we have so much that we could talk about. Um, so, you know, if you wanna kind of, um, put in what you were, were thinking about or just some kind of takeaways that you think is important to highlight for the audience. We highlighted a lot of important things for them, but just kind of like a quick um, audience takeaway uh, that you would like them to, to leave with if everyone would just like to say that and then we'll switch to questions. I just think there's so much uh, opportunity for what I call true innovation at this intersection of art and technology. And I think there's so much to use business speak opportunity cost around the world today because businesses, enterprise organizations, corporations are not embracing the arts the way they should. Um, and, I, and I truly believe that, you know, the future of our humanity and the future of innovation lies at this, this intersection and those that 
can get in on that trend early and be champions of this are the ones that are going to truly reap the rewards, whatever those rewards are. And I'm not talking about monetary rewards only. I mean other rewards as well, right? So I, I, I hope this will be a, an emerging trend that will grow. Um, and I would like to help people as much as I can overcome some of those uh, early barriers that you have in kind of bringing these two worlds together. But when you bring them together well, I think it's magical at that interface. I, this is going to sound provocative, but I don't mean it that way. Um, maybe a little bit. Um, curators and corporations are gatekeepers. So when you decide to engage artists, expand the advisory board that you uh, want to inform your decisions to incorporate voices that are as different than yours as you can. <laughs> because the people who are doing the most impactful work that are affecting the most people uh, are going to be the ones who are least likely to want to engage with you, either curators or, or corporations. And so finding those people for whom the, the first thing they think is not, how can I get something out of this museum or this technology company? Uh, those, are the, those are the ones you have to hunt out. Uh, but doing so requires bringing voices in that you wouldn't otherwise uh, necessarily think you need to bring in. So expand the advisory board. Don't gatekeep. Yes, I will leave some space for that for a minute. Um, and yeah, I guess I my parting thought might be to just um, continue to redefine the boxes, to not settle into any one paradigm, be it the art and technology one or any other, um, and to really kind of consistently unsettle the categories to, to consider what one means by art and who's making it, to consider what one means by technology and who's defining what that is and how it's brought into the world. Um, and yeah. That's great. Thank you guys. This is so good. I'm so excited. I wish we could talk forever, but we can't. So I'm um, just going to jump to questions. Uh, we're just going to do a couple. Uh, and so I have one question. How are the artists selected for the Bell Labs programs today? Largely uh, through existing partnerships that we have with cultural or academic institutes. But that's not the only way. So we leverage our network, like Seth and others, quite extensively. Seth bumps into an artist anywhere around the world in any context, has a conversation with them, thinks that they would be a great fit for us, puts us in touch, we have a conversation and we see where it goes. So there is a large part of it is true, the existing relationships, but there is this organic path to collaboration by either being introduced by one of our existing artists, which is easy, or just email me and we'll have a conversation. And if there's a way that we can work together, which by the way, can take many forms, and um, then we'll happily do that. And it might not be an opportunity for this year or next year, but maybe something comes up the, the following year. So we're completely open to those conversations. We always learn from new people we meet. And um, it's ne I've never had a bad conversation with an artist. So it's, it's all good and reach out proactively and we'll set something up. Great, thanks Duna. All right, and another question. Can someone share a story of an artist-technologist collaboration that they consider really successful? I, get, I can give a, a ton of them, but I'll give a couple of quick ones. We, we've had a bunch internally where we have started new research and we've developed technologies and products specifically and only because of an artistic interaction. New wearable devices, new algorithms to control drones because we were working with a dance group. Um, new ways to implement uh, design and visualize algorithms around movement of traffic and people in smart cities. I could go on and on. We, we have a lot of them, thankfully, and they've been uh, extremely compelling to our engineers and our scientists, and they've been taken to the level of being shown to the CEO of Nokia and on, you know, potentially on roadmaps for maybe even going to product, although that's not our end goal but I'm just giving you an example of the way that this work can manifest over time to being highly relevant for a tech company, but keeping the human centric perspective at the center of that. I've seen a handful of times at Bell Labs uh, and I've been a part of some of them, but the uh, where an artist has a hunch and that hunch defies physics. And then someone from Bell Labs goes, well, 
let's talk to the math people because I'm I think actually that might not be so such a impossible thing to do. Uh, they have this thing at Bell Labs, and they'll say it over and over again, where if if you can if you know how to do it already, you probably shouldn't bother because the, it's the problems that you don't know how to do that are the ones that are going to yield the best results. And I think that's a spot where artists and technologists in the context of Bell Labs actually intersect in their approach. And I've seen like even some of my own stuff, like like I have a hunch on a thing about how sound works. And then the next thing I know, there's a group contacting me about the way that we might fold that hunch into uh, into an actual product, which has been kind of amazing. Yeah, I'll share one thing that, that comes to mind for me is that um, our audio engineers at MPAC have been working on developing a wave field synthesis array, which um, is a 495 speaker array that um, is able to kind of spatialize sound and using the system and the software, um, we're able to control that within a performance environment. And it was originally designed for a music and sound context, but um, there have now been several instances where dance and theater artists have come to MPAC and in talking with us have been describing a kind of ideal performance scenario and an inability to get there. And we've realized that, oh, what you're actually looking for is what this wave field synthesis array can do. Um, but, but because they haven't existed um, in the States in the same way previously, no one really knew about the technology. And for me, that is like one of the best light bulb moments because it's an example of um, not someone saying, here's a technical advice, device, how do I make an art piece with it? but is instead somebody kind of like Seth is discussing, right? Somebody coming to the table saying like, here's this hunch, here's this experience I want to create. How can I do it? And then it's so satisfying when we have the thing <laughs> that we feel like really can make that happen. And what inevitably happens is that then that artistic perspective pushes the technology further than it was going before. Um, and that is just the, the beautiful thing. Um, so, yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, we have one last question here. As dominant culture gains awareness of anti-colonial thought and increases support for BIPOC cultural production, what do you see as a value statement artists should make to potential corporate partners? Well, if the artist approaches the potential corporate partner and unfortunately if they talk about their work that way they're probably not going to get in the door and that's just a, the harsh reality of where things are there's a lot of uh, corporations that um for marketing reasons and for csr reasons kind of would want you to believe that they even would understand what that question is but unfortunately, I can tell you, they absolutely do not. They're so short-sighted and can only consider the next quarter of profits. And I think when I advise artists on how you get in the door, it's to try and figure out a way that you can communicate the value of your work in a way that they'll understand and appreciate, but not that it devalues your work. And you might have to get in the door initially, being compromising the way you communicate the value of your work but once you get in the door and people see the value of that and they get to understand you and know you, now you can start educating and breaking that system that exists. But trying to break that from the outside is going to be exceptionally difficult. I mean, there's so many forces uh, in these corporations um, that will act against you being able to kind of come in day one and instantiate that kind of change. So you have to understand these forces. You have to understand uh, the people that are behind the uh, corporate initiatives and you have to figure a way to first get yourself in the door without devaluing your work but then through those relationships you build you can educate them and help the world be a better place so I, i'm a firm believer in that approach especially i'm talking about corporate america and uh, how you can drive this kind of change yeah and and it's such a hard question because that inevitably puts undue pressure on an artist and in particular an artist of color. Um, and so I think also it's very much to go back to kind of equating a curator with a corporation as gatekeeper, um, as Seth brought up importantly, um, I think that we 
we can make curators and artistic institutions responsible for doing that labor, right? We do have that um, frame already in place and where it isn't, it should be. Um, and, and that responsibility has to lie with the institution and the curator um, to be doing that work and to be stepping up as advocate also um, on behalf of artists in conversation with corporations. So where there is a translator present, where there is a kind of curatorial or artistic institutional or other link, maybe an academic link, whatever that may be, between a corporation and an artist or on behalf of or in conjunction with, alongside of, or on the margins of, um, you know, we can continue to sort of tap and occupy these different spaces and roles and use those hierarchical systems of power to kind of decolonize the, the spaces of corporate America where we can. Yeah, I, I would just add to that uh, to say I think I think artists think that I, I, sorry, I don't want to speak on behalf of all artists, but I do think that there's a predilection to imagine that because you have a single contact at a corporation that that person represents the corporation. And in almost no case that I'm aware of, is that true? And so the the question is, how can you, I mean, I think it, do, it does put undue labor on the artist to do the change from the inside, but I also think that effective change happens from effective work. And I think if the if there's openness to uh, to dialogue and uh, not a predisposed assumption that the that the company you're engaging is is representative of the ills of society as a whole, but rather you know uh, a, a, a a part of it, that that then that dialogue becomes much easier to to engage in. Great. Well, thank you all so much. That's all the time that we have for the webinar today. Again, I wish we had a lot more time. We have so much to talk about um, and what a, an amazing topic to sort of leave it off on. I wish, again, we had more time. But um, we will be sending out a follow-up email that will let you know uh, when the video discussion of this is posted. So it's recorded and, and then it'll be posted online. So you can review any material um, that you missed, just refresh yourself on what we talked about or feel free to share it. Um, our next Nodes session will happen November 19th, and you can find details on the website getonthegrid.org um, and the Gota, the Guta Institute's website and social media page as well. So on behalf of Dunal, Ashley, and Seth, as well as the, the team of the Guta Institute, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time out of your day. And thank you so much to our panelists. You guys did an amazing job. Um, really, it was an incredible conversation. Uh, so my name is Marnie Benny, and have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody.